Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for, for braving the storm and coming out. Uh, I really appreciate it. Each year on this occasion, we take stock of where we've been, where we are, and where we want to go as an institution. The focus of these annual remarks is not on celebrating achievements alone, although we'll do plenty of that, nor is it simply a listing of our aspirations and the challenges we face. It's an honest assessment of the state of our university and a broad blueprint for the months and years ahead. The University of Connecticut is today an institution that is more robust and more successful than it was even a year ago. And compared to what UConn was a decade ago or two decades ago, our growth and achievements are nothing short of extraordinary. Our faculty hiring initiative, begun three years ago, has allowed us to recruit 276 new tenured or tenure-line faculty from across the nation and across disciplines. They are a broad spectrum of scholars, including both those beginning their careers as well as those who are already well-established in their fields and everything in between. This hiring has resulted in the reduction of our student-to-faculty ratio from 18 to 1 three years ago to 15.9 to 1 today, and we're not finished yet. This has allowed us to expand our course offerings for students, helping them to graduate on time, and added, the strength, added strength to UConn's research enterprise. These faculty are augmenting the university's teaching and research abilities in fields we're already strong in, as well as allowing us to invest in new and emerging disciplines. On the under the direction of Rich Schwab, Dean of the, School, the NEAG School of Education, and Sally Reese, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, a group of very talented faculty launched a bold new academic plan titled Creating Our Future, UConn's Path to Excellence. While the university plan was being developed, faculty in all of our colleges and schools simultaneously developed their own plans, drawing upon the larger university plan but also focusing on their unique strengths. The university plan is guided by a singular vision to achieve excellence in all aspects of our mission as a university, research, graduate and undergraduate education, teaching, and engagement. These goals and strategies drive informed investments in support of our research and educational programs. In the coming months, exciting interdisciplinary proposals from the university community will be selected for support to realize our growth as a top flagship university. And with the arrival of the class of 2018, a few short weeks ago, we welcomed one of the most academically talented and diverse freshman classes in our history, which we seem to say every year recently because it's true. We owe great thanks to the work of our Vice President for Enrollment Management, Wayne Locust, Admissions Director, Nathan First, and Director of Financial Aid, Mona Lucas. With an average SAT score of 1234, they set a new record for incoming freshmen at UConn. And we're also proud that they reflect the diversity we value so greatly, with more than one-third representing minority groups. Our freshmen include 505 newcomers to our highly competitive honors program, many of whom are among the nearly 170 valedictorians and salutatorians who chose UConn. Our freshman retention rate is 94%, and our six-year graduation rate is 83%, including 82% minority students for minority students. Those are among the highest rates in the nation, which we are exceptionally proud of. With college costs rising nationwide, UConn is devoting unprecedented amounts to financial aid. This year, UConn will spend $91.9 million on financial aid, which is about a 183% increase over 2004, when the university spent about $32 million. More than 80% of our students receive some form of financial aid. This afternoon, I'd like to share with you some key details of what will soon be finalized as the campus master plan. The process of creating this plan began last year and has been led 
by our master planner and chief university architect, Laura Cruikshank, and also our director of university planning, Beverly Wood. This master plan will be an essential roadmap as our facilities and infrastructure grow and evolve over the coming decades. We must ensure that the campus is built in a truly strategic way with regard to our academic needs, housing, sustainability, wayfinding, and architectural excellence. The master plan supports the academic plan, and we're very fortunate that both plans were created simultaneously so they could be coordinated. The goals of the master plan are many, but among them, to provide places for conversation and collaboration, emphasize landscape as an important part of the campus experience, build new and renovate old facilities for research, teaching, and scientific collaboration, create opportunities for translation and partnership with industry, expand student recreation and service opportunities, strengthen places for living and learning with new student residences, support an active and healthy community, and advance our sustainability goals, reducing pollution and protecting our beautiful natural assets. The plan will concentra concentrate growth where development already exists and will create distinctive campus districts that logically fit together to make up the overall campus experience. The process of developing the plan began last February when the master planning team began collecting data, interviewing key stakeholders, and holding meetings to discuss ideas and concepts. A master plan advisory committee representing faculty, students, staff, and community members has been meeting monthly to provide feedback, and an executive advisory committee has met with the consulting team regularly to provide input and guidance throughout the process. There have been numerous focus group meetings and two town hall meetings to invite the general campus and the community to participate in the plan development. Let me try to put the growth of our campus in perspective. 25 years ago, in 1989, the University of Connecticut consisted of about 5.8 million gross square feet of built space. The Yukon 2000 and 21st century Yukon construction programs came close to doubling that space, adding 4.2 million gross square feet for a total of 10 million. In the coming years, Next Generation Connecticut and other projects like the Yukon Tech Park are expected to add another 3.5 gross square feet, 3.5 million gross square feet of space to our campus. The master plan will incorporate already planned for construction as well as future changes and additions over a two decade period, including the following. Construction of the new Innovation Partnership Building in the Tech Park, opening in 2017. Construction of the new Engineering and Sciences Building near Chemistry, that's future home to the Institute for Systems Genomics, opening in 2017. Construction of a new residence hall for our STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and other living and learning communities, uh, seen on the screen behind me, um, to be located on Alumni Drive, and that will open in 2016. A major renovation of one of our largest and most outdated buildings, the Gantt Science Complex. I thought that would get applause. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Not enough Gantt people here. Two new science buildings, including both classroom and laboratory space on the former X lot along with, along, and, and also along Whitney Road. A new honors residence hall along Mansfield Road, a new production facility for fine arts, a new parking garage in the area of the former Brown lot, the demolition of the Torrey building, a new 4,500 seat hockey rink and parking deck possibly located at the corner of 195 and South Eagleville Road, Road, along with newly constructed student housing, replacing the outworn Mansfield apartments. A new student recreation facility, a new student health services building, the renovation of Wilbur Cross, and new soccer and baseball facilities, among others. 
It will also include other changes and improvements to the campus, including closing Hillside and Gilbert Roads to most traffic and making them pedestrian walkways, similar to Fairfield Way, with new roadways added elsewhere to accommodate traffic. Major improvements to Mirror Lake so that it retains its beauty through all seasons. A fitness trail around Horseborn Hill so that our students, faculty, and staff, and also visitors to the campus can exercise safely and challenge themselves physically. The completion of North Hillside Road to Route 44 and the establishment of what are known as woodland corridors to keep and enhance the natural character of the campus. Many of these projects are funded by NextGen Connecticut while budgeting continues on some of the longer term projects. But the master plan will put an end to decades of treating construction and renovation projects as standalone undertakings done without considering a building's place in the larger campus. Rather, the master plan is a roadmap for two decades of growth, revitalization, and improvements that will continue long after most of us have departed. Information on the master plan will be available this afternoon on UConn Today for all those who are interested in the details. The draft master plan will be presented to the Board of Trustees at their December meeting. Once the environmental reviews of the plan are complete, a final master plan will be vo voted on by the Board early next year. In Farmington, the transformation of the UConn Health Campus continues to move forward quickly. Since we broke ground in, in June of 2012, work has progressed steadily and on target. We're now nearly halfway through the construction phase of Bioscience Connecticut. As you recall, one of the primary goals of Bioscience Connecticut was to help fuel the region's economy with an infusion of construction and related jobs. To date, Bioscience has created more than 2,600 construction jobs with 81% of the contracts being awarded to Connecticut companies valued at $291 million. It's also important to note that we have continually achieved above average participation rates from minority and women-owned small businesses. One of the first buildings that visitors see upon entering the Yukon Health Campus is the new Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. This building is home to substantial laboratory space and was designed for collaboration and productivity. Already it's home to over 115 researchers and staff. Importantly, a number of promising collaborations are underway between Jackson and our faculty focused on finding solutions to vexing problems, including ovarian cancer, lung cancer, Alzheimer's disease, disparities in healthcare treatments, and more. Directly across the campus from the Jackson Building is the new Outpatient Pavilion. When it opens this winter, there'll be the first of Bioscience Connecticut's clinical projects to be completed. As you recall, one of the overarching goals of Bioscience Connecticut is to improve access to state-of-the-art care in our state. The outpatient pavilion will house many of UConn Health's ambulatory services, including the Carolyn Ray Neag Comprehensive Cancer Center, all of the practices that are now housed in the outdated Dowling South and Dowling North buildings, and a new women's health floor with OBGYN care, mammography, dermatology, and more. A year after the outpatient pavilion opens will come the grand opening of the new hospital tower. Earlier this fall, we had a topping off ceremony as the last steel beam was hoisted into place on the new hospital's frame. The new tower will include an expanded emer emergency department, which is an incredibly valuable resource to the community, as well as new units for intensive care, oncology, orthopedics, and other surgical specialties. Another goal of Bioscience Connecticut is to promote bioscience innovation Renovating the original lab space at UConn Health is pivotal to meeting this goal. The renovations are tearing down walls and providing researchers with open spaces that invite and foster collaboration and cooperation. 
The first of these renovated laboratories are already open. Also, part of the goal to expand bioscience innovation is doubling the university's incubator space for emerging businesses. Work is scheduled to begin on this addition to the uh, Cell and Genome Sciences Building this fall. Reflecting bioscience's, uh, bioscience Connecticut's goal to meet the healthcare needs of Connecticut's future, work, it, work is moving uh, forward on a 30% increase in the combined student bodies of the School of Medicine and School of Dental Medicine. To accommodate more students and faculty, design work is underway to plan an academic building addition and a renovation project. In all, it will consist of nearly 18,000 square foot addition to the existing building, and construction is expected to begin on that in spring of 2015 and be completed in 2016. Renovations to the original hospital and clinical areas are in the final stages of design. And the renovations will include Yukon Health's dental practices, the Pat and Jim Calhoun Cardiology Center, and more. The renovations are expected to be complete there in 2018. We spend a great deal of time talking about the importance of research in everything we do as an institution. But universities historically have not done a great job of explaining, or better yet, showing people what research actually means and the impact that it has. Too often, some think of universities as big high schools where students happen to sleep. Of course, the reality is far, far more complex. So rather than reaffirming the importance of research, which I do so often, I want you to take a moment to recognize just a handful of our outstanding faculty researchers and talk about the amazing work they are doing to provide some excellent examples of the consequential and vital work being done on our campuses. One of the most exciting new fields in all of academe is digital media, and UConn's new Department of Digital Media and Design is moving to the forefront of the discipline with faculty members like Tom Scheinfeld. Tom came to UConn from George Mason University. We returned the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and the New Media from an office of five people into the world's largest digital humanities center. As someone who works at the intersection of digital media and the humanities, Tom understands how new technology can revolutionize and revitalize the way we understand everything from historical document archives to fine art. To that end, he's already forged collaborations with the Connecticut Humanities and the Hartford Public Library, along with on-campus partners in a variety of disciplines. One of the newest members of our Department of Mechanical Engineering is Lila Ladani, whose previous work included fabricating new materials and prototype parts for NASA. A nationally recognized expert in advanced material science, one of the, few thing, one of the things that drew Lila to UConn was the launch of the new Pratt & Whitney Additive Manufacturing Center. And while she's been a leader in her field, she's also been at the forefront of attracting more women to careers in the engineering fields. Lila is the founder of a peer group called Women in Mechanical Engineering, a forum for colleagues in the field to share their challenges and accomplishments. Faculty members like Lila, who combine first-rate science, an affinity for partnerships with industry, an interest in improving the diversity and recruitment in their fields, uh, are the face of UConn's engagement in the sciences. Jeff Schulson came to UConn at a time when our Judaic studies field was in flux, and in the short time he's been here, he's already made a significant mark on the discipline. As director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life, he's overseen the tripling of courses offered in the field and the recruitment of new faculty. Jeff has stressed the interdisciplinary nature of Judaic studies, which includes everything from literature and language to anthropology and art history. He's also focused on expanding the conversation beyond the boundaries of the university, embarking on community lectures and visits that he likes to call the Judaic Studies Roadshow. Uh, Amy Anderson, a professor of medicinal chemistry in the School of Pharmacy, has been working to gain ground against the public health threat of drug-resistant diseases. 
Along with her fellow researcher, Dennis Wright, and students in the School of Pharmacy, Amy has developed a group of drug compounds that appear to be particularly effective against bacteria known as CREs, which can be resistant to all known antibiotics and have a mortality rate of 50%. Together, Amy and Dennis and their labs have received more than $10 million in federal research support since beginning their project, and they just won another grant to move their discoveries toward clinical trials. Brenton Gravely, a professor of genetics and developmental biology at UConn Health, is doing state-of-the-work art in genomics, a key component of our partnership with Jackson Laboratory. Brent's work touches on a variety of areas, but one of the most promising areas of inquiry is the way in which defects in the so-called alternative, alternative genetic splicing influence the onset of illnesses uh, like cancer and Alzheimer's disease. The work done in Brent's lab has so far resulted in 85 publications in peer-reviewed journals and generated about 800 terabytes of data, which I think is, is a lot. Um, <laughs> This is exactly the kind of work <laughs> that's driving major innovations in Bioscience Connecticut. Finally, Don Liu, director of the New Literacies Research Lab and the John and Maria Nieg Chair in Literacy and Technology, is doing groundbreaking work about the gap in educational outcomes replicating itself online. In a study published last month and prominently featured in media outlets like the New York Times, Don showed that lower income students lag behind their affluent peers when it comes to the most basic aspects of finding and understanding information online. As those skills become even more essential for informed citizens in the 21st century, research like Don's is going to be crucial in helping policymakers and parents address these problems. Having great researchers on the faculty is vital, but as important is giving them the support they need to thrive. Under the leadership of our Provost, Moon Choi, and our Vice President for Research, Jeff Seaman, our research support operation has shifted from several disparate offices to a coordinated and integrated unit. An executive leadership team was created and includes sponsored programs, research compliance, research development, technology commercialization and partnerships, corporate and business relations, animal care and use, research IT, environmental health and safety, all that encompass stores, Farmington, and regional campuses projects. The university's research support philosophy has shifted dramatically and is now firmly rooted in a service-driven model with the express goals of providing more effective, efficient, and accessible services and support to our faculty. Several faculty advisory committees have been reconstituted or newly constituted to provide more faculty interaction, engagement, and participation in decision making. The executive leadership team is more engaged with the schools and colleges to better meet the needs of faculty and ensure consistency in the quality of services across campuses. The VPR now explicitly oversees the research enterprise at all UConn campuses. Further, a significant upgrade in the electronic administration system for grants and related research support is currently underway. Efforts are being made to reduce the institutional and cultural barriers between UConn Health and the Storrs campus. Some of these efforts have been on a smaller scale, such as the compatible email systems and graduate student support, while others have been on a much larger scale, such as similar policies and procedures, compatible payroll and grants management systems, and similar compliance and procurement processes. The university has also created a research excellence program and scholarship facilitation fund to support faculty research scholarship and creative accomplishments, a technology commercialization and partnership unit to generate greater engagement with industry and business partners as well as faculty entrepreneurship, grant writing workshops and research development services to assist faculty in developing more robust and more competitive grant proposals. 
In order to be successful, faculty researchers need the profound, consistent support of the institution, and the university is working diligently to ensure that they receive it. Any discussion of the success of last year and the year ahead must include the Yukon Foundation. We cannot fulfill our mission without financial support of alumni, grateful patients, friends of athletics, parents, and generous donors. Last year, the foundation received philanthropic gifts and commitments totaling $81.1 million, a 23% increase over the preceding year and the highest level of giving in its 50-year history. We're especially pleased by the, by the $21.8 million donated for student support because scholarship aid is a critical priority for the university as it seeks the brightest and most talented students and strives to support and inspire their achievement. We're also gratified by the, by the $35.9 million contributed to endowed funds as these gifts provide a source of perpetual support for UConn's mission and ensure the excellence of our educational programs for future generations of scholars. Our health sciences programs received significant support last year with $24.7 million in donations and pledges, a significant increase over the preceding year. And major gifts included a $2 million bequest to the School of Dental Medicine, a $3 million gift for cancer research, $2.3 million to the School of Nursing, a $1 million gift to the School of Pharmacy, and a $6 million pledge for other medical research. United Technologies, a long and generous UConn partner invested $10 million to launch the UTC Institute for Advanced Systems Engineering at UConn to help educate the next generation of leaders in the field and at the same time strengthen UConn's reputation and its impact. Some other significant donations last fiscal year included a $1.5 million gift for a uh, faculty chair in the School of Business a million dollar pledge for our highly selective honors program, and a one million dollar pledge of support for graduate fellowships in the School of Engineering. Philanthropy's footprint is extending beyond the classroom and labs to the basketball courts and the playing fields. Just this week, our basketball student athletes and coaches have been practicing in the newly opened Basketball Champions Center, the first major structure on the Yukon campus built entirely with private donations. The 78,000 square foot facility, which will be officially named tomorrow, is a fitting tribute to UConn's historic year. Our soccer facilities are also slated for major transformation. Earlier this week, the Rizza family announced a total $8 million gift for a state-of-the-art facility that future championship teams will enjoy for years to come. This record level of philanthropy for UConn represents a growing engagement with our alumni and our donors and their willingness to support our bold vision for the university. For all of our impressive progress seen through these statistics and events, it's also important to remember that we are an institution of human beings. Mostly they are students. There are 30,000 strong across all our campuses graduate and undergraduate. And an issue that has escaped no one's attention in recent years is sexual violence and harassment on college campuses and university campuses. For far too long, this was an issue that was consigned to the periphery of conversations about university life. That is no longer the case, which is among the most positive changes in higher education in our lifetimes. It is an issue that every university is grappling with. At UConn, we have taken several critical steps in recent years to combat sexual violence and aid victims. We have made strategic hires in this area, including an assistant dean for students for victim support services who will help student victims navigate the university and its processes. Staff have also been added to our counseling and mental health services office and our wellness and prevention program. The Office of Diversity and Equity, under the leadership of our Title IX coordinator, Elizabeth Conklin, 
recently formed a Title IX investigations team fo focused exclusively on investigating complaints of sexual harassment and sexual violence. In the last year, Yukon Police Chief Barbara O'Connor created a special victims unit to take the lead in responding to all reports of sexual violence that take place on campus. While all officers in the police department have received training on responding to and investigating these serious crimes, our SVU officers received additional specialized training. And the newly formed Yukon Community Resources Team, known as CRT, has already begun meeting and includes Yukon employees, students, and off-campus partners who work to address issues of sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and stalking on campus. CRT's collaborative work ensures that UConn provides a coordinated, compassionate, trauma-informed response to victims and survivors. Under the leadership of Vice President Michael Gilbert, the Division of Student Affairs has convened a new bystander intervention task force. This task force will work throughout the 2014-15 academic year to establish a campus-wide program that increases awareness of sexual violence and empowers students to be effective bystanders. And finally, UConn has also joined the nationwide It's On Us campaign, aimed at reducing sexual violence through awareness and bystander intervention. Many of these changes, as well as the sexual assault response policy we implemented back in 2012, are designed to increase the reporting of sexual assaults at the university. This does not necessarily mean sexual assaults are on the rise. Rather, it means that the reporting of this historically underreported crime is increasing. This is absolutely essential to the continuing effort to bring this issue out of the shadows and into the light. I would also like to take a moment to say a few words about our staff. I can't overstate, overstate the appreciation we feel for the people who take care of our sick students, serve thousands of meals a day, keep the campus clean, run offices, protect our students, advise our students, clear the snow, ensure our safety, and so much more. We'd be nowhere without them, and I ask faculty and students alike to make sure that you recognize those around you who make it possible for you to study, to learn, and teach in the kind of environment that we have. Every once in a while, I will see a student stop and thank one of our gardeners tending to their work, and it makes me so happy to see. And that's what I mean by showing appreciation, which is at the heart of a truly civil university. A great campus community is one where people are tied to each other through their behavior and their values. Taken together, these are what Alexis de Tocqueville, visiting America in the 19th century, famously called habits of the heart. Our staff are the backbone of this university, and I can't thank them enough for all the work they do for us every day. As you may have seen last month, UConn remains among the top 20 public universities nationwide this year, coming in at number 19. The US News statistics are among the most competitive, closely followed, and widely maligned rankings in the academic world. They are viewed with a mixture of pride, resentment, celebration, and suspicion in higher education, depending most often on where one's institution happens to fall. I'd be the first to say, as a social scientist, that no ranking is a perfect measure of an institution. And schools can rise and drop a few places from year to year for any number of reasons. Yet they are one gauge that we look at to see how we stack up against other institutions. As important, prospective students and their families pay very close attention as well. Whatever its merits and flaws, we're glad to be where we are. I fully expect UConn to continue to move around from year to year, sometimes up, sometimes down. But wherever we land in the rankings, it's clear to most of us that our overall long-term trajectory is up. 
And that is the path that we remain on and that we strive to remain on. Beginning six years ago, the university, like the state and much of the nation, weathered the most serious and nearly catastrophic collapse of the economy since the Great Depression, and we can still feel its effects today. Like every other state agency, the university endured significant cuts to our operating budget during that time, and each year was forced to make sometimes painful reductions to our budget. During that time, each and every year, we sought to preserve our core academic mission from those cutbacks. We were successful in doing so, even managing to grow our faculty during this time and continue to implement the remarkable investments that have been made in the University of Connecticut. But our work is nowhere near finished, nor are the major undertakings we embarked on UCon in UConn in recent years. Earlier, I mentioned that the foundation had a record-breaking fundraising year last year, bringing in $81 million for scholarships, faculty, programs, initiatives, and facilities. It's an impressive number, but it's only the beginning. Under the leadership of Josh Newton, one of the most capable, driven, and energetic people I've met in higher education, the foundation's fundraising goal will rise to $100 million a year. The long-term goal, which will take a few years, is to grow UConn's endowment, which now stands at $365 million, and we'd like to grow that to a billion dollars. The era of states funding the majority of public universities' budgets has ended and will likely never return. The state of Connecticut now funds approximately 29% of UConn's actual budget, and every penny is critical to us. But knowing that, in order to meet the needs of our university in the near term and the long term, we must rely on private giving through the foundation. Our engagement with alumni and supporters has to continue to grow over the coming years, getting the university closer where we need to be in terms of philanthropy. Similarly, UConn brings in about $250 million in research funding each year. We can and we must do better, which is one of the many reasons we embarked on the faculty hiring initiative, begun in 2012, it continues today, and why we are renovating new science and engineering buildings on two of our campuses. These are also among the objectives of Bioscience Connecticut and Next Generation Connecticut that will lead UConn to its ultimate goal being a world leader in solving some of the major scientific and social challenges that face the globe today. In order to be the outstanding institution we are striving to be internationally, we must grow the research enterprise at UConn, and key to doing so is our faculty. We must continue to hire and retain outstanding faculty, and we have to give them state-of-the-art resources they need to be on the cutting edge of research competitiveness. Even if we meet our goals in these areas, we all need to understand that continued investment, additional growth, and institutional success are by no means guaranteed. The long climb to succeed for an institution, the building and rebuilding of a university is exceptionally difficult and requires our constant attention, perseverance, and support, both internally and externally. The struggle to achieve takes year after year of grinding effort, of the university working with dogged determination, clearing every hurdle, meeting every challenge head on, and making strategic, far-sighted decisions about our future. The partnership between the university, Connecticut's leaders and our committed supporters and alumni and the talented, incredibly talented faculty, staff, and students who have made UConn home are what made our success possible thus far. Getting here was hard. It was, it's much, much easier to slide backward. All of the truly remarkable and important work that has been done here at UConn can very easily become undone. And all of the incredible investments in this institution in recent years can be made hollow. If that occurred, 
the very least of our concerns would be plummeting U.S. news rankings. Rather, our greatest worry would be that we would fail our students, our faculty, our staff, the people of Connecticut who have invested so many resources into the years-long goal of making UConn an outstanding international university. After all, successful universities are not created instantaneously as if by a lightning bolt and clap of thunder, appropriate for today. They are created with consistent strategic investments made over decades by many leaders and many partners. The UConn 2000 construction program took two decades to reshape our campuses. If fully funded, Bioscience Connecticut and Next Generation Connecticut will take as long. And with respect to those programs, let me underscore, their success will not be found in the construction of buildings alone. It will happen by ensuring that we can put the people and the resources inside those buildings that are necessary to do the work that needs to be done. Having magnificent structures that sit partially empty or millions in unspent bond funds sitting idle because the university lacks the budget necessary to operate new facilities would defeat the far-reaching goals of those initiatives and the purpose of the university itself. Educating our students, spreading vital knowledge, conducting critical research, fueling economic development, and producing skilled graduates who will continue to contribute to our society and Connecticut's workforce in a myriad ways takes so much more than bricks and mortar alone. We cannot and will not lose sight of this, and we will never start, stop making our case for wise and consistent investments in UConn that will make the university that Connecticut, will create the university that Connecticut wants us to be and that the state really deserves. We will do all that. Uh, we'll stay on the path that we've, we've been on, but we can't do it alone. We need the hard work and thoughtful contributions of our faculty, our staff, and our students. We need ever greater support from friends, from supporters, from alumni. And most of all, we need the partnership and the leadership of the state of Connecticut, which has done so much for so long to make this an outstanding university for our students and our state. We have come so far so quickly that it is unimaginable that we would turn back now. As always, our future will not be secured by simply trumpeting past successes. The future is based on the work that we do here today and the opportunities that lie ahead. Thank you for your time, for coming today, and for your amazing pride in the University of Connecticut. Thanks, everybody.